Kia ora koutou. And welcome. Uh, I'm Sarah, a member of Te Whanganui Atara branch of the International Socialist Organisation. I appreciate your interest today in hearing about AUKUS, USA imperialism, China and the new Cold War. I've got, well I wrote half an hour, but I'll admit 40 minutes uh, of material to cover, uh, following which there'll be some chaired discussion. I'm happy to answer discussion questions to the best of my ability during that discussion period, but uh, rather than looking to me as some kind of an expert, um, I would suggest that you use some of this introduction period to consider your own political responses and how this fits in with the experiences of things that uh, information that you've been exposed to and political analysis that you've been exposed to um, so that you can best contribute in that discussion a little bit later on as well. Uh, I hope collectively we can tease out some of the strands of events in the greater Pacific region to hone our understanding and ability to decide what we might realistically do from there. There are some foundations and context to this discussion that I want to lay out before we go any further. This will be a talk about war and the tensions that surround war, and it's likely at times that it will cover some unpleasant um, and uncomfortable ground. It's my intention to address this material seriously and with the weight it deserves, and that means you may wish to mentally prepare yourself for hearing about and considering issues of war and violence, uh, or you may wish to leave the room now or at any time during the talk. It's okay and important to look after your own well-being in order to continue to effectively take on the wider issues. I'll leave self-care in your hands, uh, but please be re uh, reassured that it is okay uh, to step out. I also want to be very clear that I'm not engaging in any whose side are you on rhetoric when it comes to the governments that we'll be talking about throughout. Uh, as international socialists, we stand against capitalism and against imperialism. Australia, the USA and the UK are all proudly capitalist and they're committed to ensuring the continuance of self-interested competition between private individuals and companies. China competes as a state-sized entity in the capitalist marketplace and in the same way it does so in the same way as private companies do and also has numerous, pri numerous private companies operating within its borders and international markets. All of the aforementioned countries engaged in imperialist posturing and action. None of them represent the world that we're building towards. But I also want to be very clear that it's the capitalists and capitalist governments that we stand against, not the working people of those countries. This talk and subsequent discussion is not an opportunity for racism, xenophobia, or the promotion of imperialism or colonialism of our own. The international in our name identifies us as internationalist in our politics. Our vision is of all working people united, empowered, and in control of their lives. And there's absolutely no place for racism in that vision. Journalist John Pilger reports that as early as 1943, Japan had attempted to discuss with the USA a peaceful conclusion to the Pacific War. By May the 5th, 1945, the USA military had intercepted communications confirming the Japanese were desperate for peace, including capitulation, even if the terms were hard. The then USA Secretary of War later admitted that no effort was made and none was seriously considered to achieve surrender merely in order to not have to use the bomb. Rather, it seems, the USA military was eager to test their new weapons on two Japanese cities. The USA estimated 100,000 immediate deaths. And later estimates suggest that that many deaths again from all cause, causes happened, um, including from radiation poisoning. Shortly after the war, uh, the USA conducted an analysis, uh, which it called the Strategic Bombing Survey. And I'd like to invite my comrade Brad uh, to quote from that document. This is the survey's opinion that certainly prior to the 31st of December 1945, and in all probability prior to the 1st of November 1945, Japan would have surrendered even if atomic bombs had not been dropped, even if Russia had not entered the war, and even if no invasion had been planned or contemplated. It's telling that that same survey also enthusiastically recorded. The first and crucial question about the atomic bomb thus was answered practically and conclusively. 
atomic energy had been mastered for military purposes and the overwhelming scale of its possibilities had been, had been demonstrated. Hearing this, I hope you have a sense of revulsion, as I do, at the willingness to sacrifice human lives for the purpose of testing out a new tool of annihilation. Keep a hold of that feeling, because we are going to circle back here a few times over the next half an hour or so, and through the course of this talk, hopefully develop some more context to understand the kinds of challenges that we're up against. Australia has been toying with the idea of new submarines for about 15 years now. In 2009, the then Labor government proposed the purchase of 12 new submarines to replace an aging fleet. Successive Australian governments have scrapped previous government's plans and then developed ideas instead of purchasing first Japanese and then French submarines. The latest AUKUS plan was commenced under Liberal National Coalition, led by Scott Morrison. This plan constitutes a three-way military agreement between Australia, the UK and the USA, and the severance of earlier formed French military ties. The AUKUS deal commits these three countries to a range of military activities, including for USA Virginia-class and UK Astute-class nuclear submarines to operate from HMAS Stirling Base near Perth. Australian broadcaster ABC notes this combination of location and submarine design can quickly reach waters around Thailand and can operate there for an extended period. Australia agrees to buy at least three used Virginia-class submarines by the early 2030s, with an option to purchase a further two and will be constructing uh, within Australia newly UK and USA designs SSN AUKUS-class submarines through the early 2040s right out to the 2060s. The AUKUS deal doesn't provide Australia with nuclear weapons, uh, but Australia's new acquisitions will nonetheless carry cruise missiles which would be able to, quote, linger off the Chinese coast and directly threaten China with the threat of cruise missile strikes, end quote, as reported by Australia's state broadcast ABC. Most reports about AUKUS focus on submarine purchase and construction, which is understandable, given the massive resource drain, nuclear proliferation and military escalation issues that the deal raises. However, another aspect of the AUKUS deal includes shared development of military technology with the three countries. This includes the development of quantum computing and communications, hypersonic missiles and artificial intelligence. Standing alongside Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at Naval Base San Diego, USA President Joe Biden said, quote, the United States would not ask for two better friends or partners to stand with us as we work to create a safe, more peaceful future for the people everywhere, end quote. Dr. Beck Strating of La Trobe University, Melbourne, describes the situation as, quote, politicians and members of the Australian strategic elite have been really bought into this idea of US-led integrated deterrence. This idea that the US, along with its allies and partners, needs to brand to band together to collectively provide a counterweight to China in the Asian region. The bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941 and the subsequent entry of the USA into World War II didn't happen in a vacuum. The USA had imperialist designs in the Pacific throughout the 19th century, which included the appropriation of Hawaii and the Philippines. By the end of World War I, the USA viewed Japan as one of its main military rivals, the other being the UK. And multilateral disarmament treaties achieved limited success um, with naval reductions. From 1940 onwards, though, the USA elected to introduce increasing sanctions against Japan in response to ongoing Japanese invasion of China, which was an important market for USA trade. As the Pacific powers jostled for dominance, and apparently convinced that the USA was opposed to any further negotiated solution, the Japanese Navy carried out the famous attack that drew the USA into World War II. In our times, there's some different actors and some of the same actors playing different roles. But nonetheless, these events 80 plus years ago feel uncomfortably similar to rising Pacific tensions today. <laughs> 
Australia's part in the submarine deal will cost it between 268 and 368 billion Australian dollars. Somewhere in the middle of that range equates to an expenditure of around 11, 11 billion dollars per year, every year for three decades. Albanese describes this as the single biggest investment in Australia's defence capability in all of our history. The Australian Prime Minister seems rather proud of his new submarines, but it might be useful to stop and consider what else this money might have been used for. Contrast the $11 billion per year spent on submarines against Australian government's intent to commit only $2 billion a year over the next decade towards technological development targeting carbon net zero. Perhaps rather than underwater death machines, Albanese might have made a greater commitment to stave off climate disaster. Or consider that in two th- uh, sorry, 2023 in Australia, almost one in sorry, almost one million people live in what the World Bank calls severe food insecurity, and just over three million people live below the national po- poverty threshold. According to the Australian Homelessness Monitor, a significant driver of poverty is increasing housing costs. At any given time, around one in two hundred people in Australia experiencing homelessness. Perhaps the Australian government might have considered financing or at least subsidising high-quality, high-density accessible housing, coupled with improving the economic safety net for those in poverty. The cost of the AUKUS deal to the Australian public is in the ballpark of the $291 Australian billion spent by their government on an economic response to COVID so far. A pandemic which globally has killed millions of people and severely disrupted the lives of many more. COVID will continue to exert stresses on health and social organising for some time to come. Is the Australian government so sure that the pandemic is sufficiently over that it can afford to throw money into imperialist war games? Australia plans to increase its number of nuclear reactors from one that it currently has, primarily used for medical and scientific research, to constructing at least 11 more, simply to be able to meet the fuel requirements for the new AUKUS submarines. Meanwhile, China's been communicating with the International Atomic Energy Agency to express concerns that the submarines are powered by weapons-grade nuclear material, um, while supply of nuclear energy material under the AUKUS agreement constitutes a breach of international treaties and an illegal step towards an Australian nuclear weapons program. Regardless of legality, though, Australia will also have to address the issue of disposal of the enriched weapons-grade nuclear waste that it will be generating. The Australian Deputy Prime Minister, Richard Marlis, has given assurances that the nuclear waste will be stored responsibly and safely on Australian defence land, current or future. I imagine I'm not alone in my scepticism of the assurance of safety. I suspect also a degree of cynicism on Marlis's part in omitting to acknowledge whether Australian First Peoples will be involved in decisions of storage of waste on land which was stolen and never ceded. Waste which will remain radioactive for the next 20,000 years. The ABC notes that Australia has thus far failed to achieve stable storage even of its current low-grade, comparatively less dangerous nuclear waste. This hardly bodes well for the future. In these examples, I've arbitrarily focused on Australia simply because it's the nearest AUKUS country to us. Uh, But in these examples, and with some slightly adjusted figures, we might easily have just been talking about China, the US, the UK. The citizens of each of those countries and of all countries of the world could have been better served if, rather than throwing money into new nuclear imperialist applications, these governments chose to spend their money addressing social and environmental problems instead. Quoting another excerpt from the USA military survey shortly after Japan's surrender. Hiroshima is built on a river delta. It is flat and a little above sea level. The total city area is 26 square miles, but only 7 square miles of the centre were densely built up. The principal industries, which had been greatly expanded during the war, were located on the periphery of the city. The population of the city had been reduced from approximately 340,000 to 245,000 as a result of a civilian defence evacuation program. The explosion caught the city by surprise. An alert had been sounded, but in the view of the small number of planes, the all clear had been given. Consequently, the population had not taken shelter. 
I don't know about you all. I find that an incredibly difficult thing to read uh, when I was preparing the speech or, or hear. This is a picture of Hiroshima uh, just prior to the bombing. I wanted to share that excerpt for two reasons. First, war is waged not just against military infrastructure, on metal and concrete, but on human lives and human homes. It's critically important when we're considering ac abstract phrases like rising tensions that we recognise that we're talking about the risk of enabling bloodthirsty mass murderers. The second reason is because I think it's well beyond coincidence that the G7 convened this year in Hiroshima. The Group of Seven, or G7, is a conference of the heads of state of Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK, the USA, and also includes an EU representative. Following their conference, the G7 releases a public statement summarising their position on shared political goals which range from climate to digital technology to economic. The G7 statement provides an insight into the mindset of these governments. Unsurprisingly, the 2023 statement made sweeping positive statements about free market capitalism and proposes free trade and the leveraging of private finance as solutions for much of the world's woes. Only around 3% of the statement by word count addresses China explicitly, and a number of other chi um, countries, regions, and political groups are also discussed elsewhere in the document. Uh, where China is concerned, the statement actually starts out with a rather positive tone, an expression of preparedness to develop constructive and stable relations. The statement quickly proceeds, however, to rather hypocritical calls for China to engage in discussions of climate and bloodthirsty, uh, sorry, we'll get to bloodthirsty shortly, uh, to engage in discussions of climate and biodiversity crises, uh, debt stability, and global health. Uh, I'd like to call on um, my comrade Romani um, to quote the G7 directly. Our policy approaches are not designed to harm China, nor do we seek to thwart China's economic progress and development. A growing China that plays by international rules would be of global interest. We are not decoupling or turning inwards. At the same time, we recognise that economic resilience requires de-risking and diversifying. We will take steps individually and collectively to invest in our own economic vibrancy. We will reduce excessive dependencies in our critical supply chains. In other words, either China complies with the G7 or trade with China will be cut. The underlying assumption is that China is currently not playing by the rules as set by everyone else, with the G7 being unquestionably the legitimate representatives and spokespeople of those rules. At the same time, many news media appear to be relatively uncritical, supporting Western imperialism, to the point of act act actively feeding justifications to the politicians rather than examining their motivations. The Sydney Morning Herald takes stoking tension to a whole new level with the following, and I quote, While the official Canberra guidance on timing is that Australia will have less than 10 years warning of war, the five experts, discussed in the Sydney Morning Herald's series of articles, think that this timeline is misleading. We will need to be ready to fight in just three years, they found. Their review is titled accordingly. Read alert. The UK state broadcaster BBC gives considerable space for UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. As he says of AUKUS, quote, We represent three allies who have stood shoulder to shoulder for more than a century. Three peoples who have shared blood together in defence of our shared values. And three democracies that are coming together again to fulfil that higher purpose, maintaining freedom, peace and security now and for generations to come. In that quote, the same BBC report follows on with commentary from journalist Chris Mason to support a cherry-picked quotation. Um, Chris Mason says, Compare and contrast what you've just heard with this. China's leader, Xi Jinping, also promises to modernise its military. To turn it, he says, into a great wall of steel. In that quote. 
The reporter goes on to ask Sunak, is China dangerous? And receives the slam dunk response, quoting Sunak now, China is a country with fundamentally different values to ours, and it represents a challenge to the world order. End quote. The setup and delivery of this fear-mongering is obvious. Sunak has openly referenced bloodshed, yet the report is structured to lead the viewer, or listener, to sense that Western powers are merely seeking peace, while China is seeking to disrupt that peace. More balanced reporting, for example from Al Jazeera, gives slightly more context to Jinping's words. We should strengthen the national people's Sorry, we should strengthen the national defence and army modernisation, building the People's Army into a great wall of steel that effectively safeguards national security and development interests. Jinping also says, We should actively promote the peaceful development of the relationship across the Taiwan Strait, resolutely oppose external interference and Taiwan independent separatist activities. Now, rest assured, I'm not unconditionally leaping to Jinping's defence here. He is still describing a military build-up. It's unclear what national security and development interests could include, and he's punching down to Taiwanese independence. Nonetheless, even with a slight additional context, the BBC's bias is crystal clear. Great Wall of Steel was not used in a clearly offensive context. Um, there appears to be a reference to the Great Wall as defensive infrastructure. And Jinping's words when referring to Taiwan are, quote, the peaceful development of a relationship. Again, quite different from how the BBC portrays it. We can maintain a healthy distrust of the veracity of a politician's words, while also acknowledging that even those words are being blatantly misrepresented in media that we rely on. Self-defence is a reasonable justification for maintaining some degree of military capability. And certainly history is littered with examples of invasion, subjugation and genocide. The ISO does not, to my knowledge, subscribe to pacifism. We stand against imperialism and colonialism. We also stand for the right of people to defend themselves against attack. There is clearly a complex question to consider of exactly what is required to ensure legitimate defence is possible. There's also a critical question for us to um, consider of whether any of the political alliances, state posturing and military escalation discussed here is truly for self-defence at all. The Western Alliance claims that China represents th a threat which we must be ready to defend against. That claim of a threat is multifactorial. In addition to the military threat suggested earlier, the G7 references threats to economic and legal status quo, assuming that we'll all agree the current approach is the pinnacle of all human existence and is worth fighting to uphold. I'd just like to call on uh, my G7 comrade. G7. With a view to enabling sustainable economic relations with China and strengthening the international trade trading system, we will push for a level playing field for workers and companies. We will seek to address the challenges posed by China's non-market policies and practices, which distort the global economy. We will counter malign practices such as illegitimate technology transfer or data disclosure. We will foster resilience to economic coercion. We also recognize the necessity of protecting certain advanced technologies that could be used to threaten our national security without unduly limiting trade and investment. In counterpoint, China claims the Western countries are the ones carrying out the provocation, and any escalation is only necessary to defend itself. What we see from our perspective is both sides claiming to be under threat while engaging in an arms race reminiscent of the Cold War of last century. Both China and the G7 claim to want a peaceful resolution to issues of ownership of Taiwan. Meanwhile, both China and the USA construct Pacific military bases and proliferate naval combat systems. Both China and the USA move their existing combat craft right to the edge of borders. If we observed children 
provoking a rival uh, a rivalry um, by standing right at the edge of someone else's space, brandishing a stick, claiming that it was only for self-defense. Uh, we wouldn't hesitate to label those kinds of actions as immaturity. Sadly, distressingly, and nauseatingly, these are, however, the actions of numerous fully grown adults who are in control of technology capable of ending our existence, or immiserating it to appease, appease their own whims. Furthermore, we should consider the track record of these countries in making decisions that further the well-being of people within their own borders and internationally. The Chinese government recently brutally put down a struggle for democracy in Hong Kong, has retained a tight grip on Tibet for over half a century, has an oppressive and brutal approach to the Uyghur people, and can in no way trusted to be can be in no way trusted to act in a fair and peaceful way towards the people of Taiwan. The USA has a history of supporting terrorism abroad, such as in Indonesia, Chile, and Haiti, of outright invasion, such as happened to Iraq and Afghanistan, of putting its own citizens at extreme risk, such as the recent repeal of the right to abortion, censoring and reviling the LGBTQI plus community, and enabling ongoing violence against people of color. As an example of the last, the USA's National Association for Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, recently put out a statement of one of the parts of the USA, um, which I would argue is only flawed in that it's too cautious in its scope. They say, Florida is openly hostile towards African Americans, people of color, and LGBTQ plus individuals. Before traveling to Florida, please understand that the state of Florida devalues and marginalizes the contributions of and other challenges faced by African Americans and other communities of color. This is a part of the same country that supposedly in upholds international law and brings the world freedom through firepower. Now, I was particularly interested in resource allocation and in claims of um, China's growing military might, which I, I saw numerous times throughout articles. Um, so I examined publicly available World Bank data with military size and spending to consider the relative threats of these military forces. Of course, this analysis comes with some caveats, so we don't hold the World Bank up as the paragon of truth, certainly not of unbiased action, um, but we've got limited resources to uh, obtain this sort of data. and uh, This is publicly available information. Um, obviously, there'd be some inconsistencies so around who is considered mer uh, military personnel within each country, and even the World Bank acknowledges that um, the, the confounding of that data is so complicated that they can't um, separate it out. They've got much more resources than I do. Uh, but I'm sharing this analysis with you to give an overview of relative military might uh, with a greater degree of objectivity than we might see in G7 statements um, and much of the news media reporting. In terms of military size, China has the greatest number of military personnel, 2.5 million. This is um, just less than twice the number of military personnel in the USA. Uh, those numbers need to be examined a little more closely, though. Uh, China's a large country with a large population. Um, and when each country's military personnel is examined uh, relative to their population, we see a different picture. So the top right there. Uh, considering proportion of population, um, that gives us insight into the relative importance each country places on military service compared with other activities. Uh, by this measure, the USA far outweighs the other countries that we're discussing today with about 0.4% of the entire population, or looking at the bottom graph, essentially showing the same sort of picture, uh, but by a slightly different measure, there's 0.8% in the USA of the total labor force engaged in the military. China, on the other hand, is comparable to Aotearoa uh, with just uh, under 0.2% of each um, country's population or 0.3% of each country's labor force engaged in the military. Um, we can look at change over time. Um, we see that most of the countries under discussion today have maintained roughly the same number of personnel at least since the turn of the century. Uh, since the year 2000, the number of military personnel in the UK and China have fallen by 30% and 35% respectively. 
uh, the significant different decreases in military staff, especially uh, in China's case, this represents the demilitarization of well over a million people. In the same period, the USA and New Zealand have decreased their military personnel by 5% and 2% respectively, whereas Australia has increased by 14%. So even acknowledging the likely confounding factor of personnel being replaced by technology, a comparison of these changes, or lack of changes over time, suggests that China is actually de-emphasizing its military size in terms of number of staff, uh, compared with the other AUKUS countries. Um, this is in contradiction to any claims of China increasing its military size. Sorry, now we'll, there we go. Now we'll get on to talking about military spending. Um, USA has by far the largest expenditure on military activities, an eye-watering 734 billion US dollars per year, um, compared with China, just over one third of that budget, uh, equivalent of 240 US billion dollars. Um, this nonetheless dwarfs the spending of the UK, Australia, and Aotearoa. Examining snapshots of military spending compared with other financial activities. Uh, we see a much greater prioritisation of military spending in the USA compared with other countries that we're discussing. So GDP, gross domestic product, is the total value of stuff produced in the country. If you were to sort of create a financial measure of all economic activity, um, USA sits around 3.5% uh, of all of that economic activity being military. Uh, by comparison, the UK is 2.2%, China 2.0%. USA spends about 8.3% uh, of its total government budget, which is what the, um, the lower graph on the right is showing, total government spending. 8.3% by the USA, 5% uh, by China, 4.7% uh, by the UK. You can also examine these countries' change in spending over time. Uh, military expenditure in absolute US dollars is increasing in both countries. Um, thanks to Josh earlier on talking about uh, inflation, um, we can look at this thing CPI is about the best measure that I was able to get. Lots of problems with what CPI is. Uh, it's a basket of goods, not necessarily um, the value of cruise missiles, but nonetheless, uh, that's a, a, a stand-in for inflation in this case. So if he, effectively, I'm applying CPI change to the absolute dollars of military expenditure. Um, to end up with this graph here, military expenditure adjusted for inflation. Uh, essentially, this is showing that, yes, um, China's spending more on its military, uh, but so is the USA. Uh, and if you compare the overall rates um, of growth since the year 2000, like change in time, uh, change over time, sorry, uh, the growth of the USA spending is actually 20% greater than China's. Uh, so claims that China is increasing its military budget are true, uh, but the USA's military budget is growing faster. Until this point, I've been providing an overview of the current situation, and I've been placing this in a historical context. There's time now to move to time now to um, move towards considering why things are the way they are, uh, so that I can wrap this up and um, allow you all to contribute into this discussion. Okay. We'll also very briefly um, touch on where to from here. Um, spoilers: it's creating a coherent and strong left wing. Mm -hmm. um, from the part of the G7's recent statement on what it calls fair trade and coercion. And one final statement from uh, my G7 comrade. We reaffirm our shared concerns for non-market policies and practices, including the problematic evolution that distort global competition, trade and investment. We will further step up our efforts to secure a level playing field through the more effective use of existing tools as well as development of appropriate new tools and stronger international rules and norms. We will seek to ensure that our responses to unfair trading practices will not create unnecessary barriers to our partners' industries and are consistent with our WTO, World Trade Organization, commitments.
Uh, so it's an attempted justification for future action. It's just a small snapshot of the capitalist mindset. Um, consider that those words are in light of the statement quoted earlier, um, where in the G7 countries are justifying diminishing trade with China. And here they're talking about level playing fields and acting against economic coercion. Uh, so unashamedly um, hypocritical. Capitalism is a system of economic and social organisation which has not existed forever. And it will not persist forever. We're in an age of capitalist realism where many people believe capitalism is the only functional way our human existence might be organised. And one of our most pressing tasks as socialists is to educate the broad public on capitalism's inherently unstable and necessarily temporary nature. This is not a task we can take lightly or allow significant delay in undertaking. It's a realistic possibility that, left unchecked, the combination of concentrated power, competition and systemic instability might end human existence. Capitalism is a system reliant on accumulation achieved through primitive means such as warfare, or through more complex means, such as the interplay of production and wages than the employer-employee relationship. Successful capitalists achieve continual accumulation in a world of limited resources by acquiring the resources of their competitors. The result is the concentration of resources, power, capital, in fewer and fewer hands, as the natural limits of accumulation Within a region or approach, the capitalist must look to neighbouring regions for the target of their greed. And the state, the bureaucratic mechanism by which a ruling class achieves its goals, serves capitalists exactly as intended, as intended uh, when it advances colonial and imperialist goals in neighbouring regions. Economic exploitation, aggressive tensions and warfare are all inevitable because infinite expansion on a limited planet is assumed possible and unavoidable. So growing Pacific tensions are entirely to be expected. A predictable outcome of both free market and state capitalism and both economic pressures designed to subdue rivals and open militarism and warfare are inevitable so long as we fail to progress beyond capitalism. Because of the situation we find ourselves in, question of what do we do now must be broken down into two parts. First, there's the necessary band-aid or firefighting actions that we must take to ensure our immediate survival and minimise the suffering of millions or billions of people. For that one, building a movement against imperialism is thankless work, as many activists around the world know, but it cannot be ignored. Decisions on our very survival cannot be left to those who are driven only by greed and also greeting warmongers and their goons, so they must be opposed by the masses. But we won't successfully build that mass movement without political education that ensures that the threats are widely understood. So by being here today, you are participating in that educational project, a necessary step in building widespread resistance to both national uh, resistance against uh, nationalism and competitive approaches of social organisation. We must also move beyond simply reaching to individual threats, reacting to individual threats and crises. A successful peace movement which de-escalates uh, US-China tensions will help uh, in the here and now, uh, but there will be other simultaneous uh, and future threats. And without building ourselves towards a point where something more sustainable can be achieved, we will forever be running on a treadmill to resist existential threats which are the inevitable consequence of our underlying social system. We're going to have to change that underlying social system. We must build something new, equitable and stable for all of humankind. And I'm here to tell you, and many of my comrades are here to tell you, that that something is socialism. Got it.